Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the sanctuary and online as well to our New Year's Eve worship service. I'd like to welcome everyone, too, as we do close out another calendar year and, and look to start yet a new one. We do it all with God in prayer and praise to God. So with that, would you please stand for the invocation? As another year of God's grace, mercy, and peace upon us draws to a close, we begin our time of worship together at year's end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. We sing our opening hymn, Across the Sky, the Shades of Night. confess together. God of the ages, I earnestly desire your presence on the threshold of this new year. Yet my sins prevent me from entering your presence. I confess that I have sinned against you. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed, but some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore me, that I may rest in peace. Amen. In the mercy of the God of the ages, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing again.
pray together. O God of the ages, as we leave the year that is past, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, whose blood was shed for us, have mercy on us. Triune God, in whose name we are baptized, have mercy on us. Lord of time and eternity, as we enter this new year, have mercy on us. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, we commit to your mercy and forgiveness the year now ending, and commend to your blessing and love the times yet to come. In the new year, abide among us with your Holy Spirit, that we may always trust in the saving name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings from Scripture. The Old Testament reading for this evening comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, the 30th chapter. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, No, we will flee upon horses. Therefore you shall flee away, and we will ride upon swift steeds. Therefore your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee, till you are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson for this evening comes to us from Romans, the eighth chapter. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand now for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the twelfth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, He will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, 
begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated now for the sermon hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The cat's away, the mice can play. The boss is out of the office. Now we can relax and take it easy. Or maybe better for these times, ah, working from home, it's, it's so nice. I think I'll just go for a long walk. Or how about, I went to Sunday school all those years. I know all those stories. I'm good for it. I've finished confirmation. Ah, it's like graduation. Really. Those attitudes are certainly not what our gospel lesson tonight talked about. Reading from the first part, Luke 12, verses 35 and 37. Stay dressed, ready for action. 
and keep your lamps burning. Be like the men who are waiting for their men who are waiting for their master to return, to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door for him at once when he comes inside, when he comes and knocks. Dressed, ready for action. How are we to be dressed and ready for action? Well, if we take it literally, we can look at the scripture for guidance. We would find Moses preparing Aaron for his priestly duties. He outfitted Aaron with a sash, clothed him with a robe, fastened it with an ephob, ephod on, and a decorative waistband around his waist. He placed a breastpiece on him. He put a turban on Aaron's head with a gold emblem in the middle of it. Or in Ezekiel, we learn that priests had to wear a linen turban on their heads and linen undergarments. And oh, by the way, they had to wear garments that wouldn't allow them to sweat. We read in Second Kings that Elijah wore a leather belt and a hair uh, garment. Similarly, John the Baptist wore a leather belt and a garment of hair. Well, they were literally dressed for action. And I suppose today where many of us are wearing leather belts and maybe on a night like tonight, we'd welcome the warmth of a camel hair coat. If you look at those, those are all just taking things literally. Fortunately, our outward appearance is not what makes us properly dressed for action in the Lord's service. There's no dress code here. So much for the fashions. Remember, this is a parable. There's a more fitting answer in Scripture to the issue of being dressed for action. Isaiah, speaking of the Messiah, says, Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. In probably the most inclusive and concise description, Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, gives a description of what it is to be dressed for service, dressed for action. And how fitting it is that Paul calls this outfit armor. Reading from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in our heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of the evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. As you go about your daily tasks, do you consider yourselves dressed in the armor of God in your day-to-day -day activities? Are you thusly dressed for action? The first item of armor that Paul talks about in our attire is given as the belt of truth. Paul says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. In a world filled with falsehoods that masquerade as the truth, we need the truth, the real truth. There are those who say that our belief is old or outmoded. They say things are different now in this modern era. Modern world, modern era, contemporary world. Truth is truth no matter the time. It's timeless. As Solomon said, there is no, nothing new under the sun. God's truth is timeless. It does not change. Therefore, let us think of ourselves as one of the servants in tonight's gospel parable, waiting for the master of the house to return, attired in the unchanging belt of truth. As we await Christ's return, we are to remain in his word. The Holy Scriptures give us the word of truth to be fully clothed, fully dressed, 
Let us continue to be in God's word daily as we wait the master's return. Paul continues his description of the armor by calling for the breastplate of righteousness. Ah, the breastplate. The breastplate, along with the helmet, is probably one of the, the most important pieces of armor. One could go to battle with maybe a damaged protection for their hand. In fact, they could sustain an injury to their arm, maybe their foot. But the chest, the breastplate, all these other parts are smaller targets. But the breastplate protects the heart. It protects the life. So it's no small thing that Paul is inspired to call the breastplate that preserver of life, the breastplate of righteousness. The righteousness that we have imputed upon us through the suffering, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. It does indeed preserve our life. Our righteousness through Christ's atoning work has guaranteed our inheritance to eternal life. Nothing, no blows of the enemy can penetrate the breastplate of his righteousness. So as servants waiting for the master of the house to return, we are confident when he returns to us, we will be ready for him. The next item of attire is for us to be dressed and ready for service. It will prepare, prepare us for action as we get ready to move out. But first, we have to put this item on. Only then will it be effective. So Paul continues with, with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Let me restate that. The gospel of peace gives readiness to our feet. Through Christ, God no longer sees all of our past and future failures. We are at peace with God. He looks at us and he sees his son, his good and perfect son. The peace frees us from the cares and worries of this world. It frees us for action. Now, with our feet fitted with readiness, we can go to work. As we wait for the master of the house to return, he has work for us to do. Paul, in his letters to the church in Thessalonica, implies that some believers were living in idleness. You see, they, we can conjecture that they expected the imminent return of the Lord, so they just thought they'd just take it easy until it happened. Paul warns, while we are at peace, knowing Christ will come, we must continue to work in his righteousness, to work for his kingdom. As Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Next in the armor, we are to take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then there's the helmet of salvation, that other great preserver of life, our life. And we are to take up the sword of the Spirit, that's the Word of God. And finally, in Ephesians 6, Paul says, there is prayer. The servant waiting for the master to return is to pray in the spirit on all occasions. The ancients depended upon an armor bearer to attend them. That armor bearer maintained the attire and prepared the warrior for battle. We can think of God as our armor bearer, always at our side, providing all we need to be dressed for his service. God, our armor bearer, wants us to be dressed and ready for his service with a belt of truth, a breastplate of righteousness, feet 
fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel, with a shield of faith, a helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, his holy scripture, and the Spirit to lead us in prayer. So, once you're ready, once you're dressed for service, tonight's parable in Luke continues. It says, keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding feast. Persistence. Keep your lamps burning. In another parable about lamps, Jesus relates the kingdom of heaven to the ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom to appear. Half of the virgins took their lamps and they took extra oil. Half of them just took their lamps and lit. Well, the bridegroom was very late in coming, and around midnight he shows the five wise ones who had their lamps, and they had oil, extra oil, or we could say batteries. They were ready. When the, every, when the bridegroom arrived at midnight, all of the virgins awoke. Five were ready, five were not. The five that were not rushed out for oil, and they got locked out. The parable ends later. The five that went out for oil returned. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So the message tonight also tells us to keep our lamps burning as we await his return. The first week in Advent, we lit the first Advent candle, which represents hope. Anticipation of the coming of Christ. That first candle continued to be lit every week. In the following weeks, every week until the final week, until Christmas, when we lit the white Christ candle. The white candle signifies Christ's coming, his birth, his presence among us. John chapter 1 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. At this time of the year, with all the busyness, the health concerns, the pressures of life, the pressures of the world, how many of us have let our lamps run out of oil, our batteries run low? I venture to say that many of us have. It's been an extraordinary year. If we have let our lamps go dim, we can put that past us and live as redeemed people of God, prepared Lamps lit, burning, batteries charged, anticipating his return as he enables us. And while we wait, as redeemed people, does not mean that we can be complacent in today's gospel parable. There's no complacency there. Jesus is speaking to people who had long expected the coming of the Messiah, the Old Testament prophets had always warned that the people were to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. Even those exiled in Babylon were told by the prophet Jeremiah to be to bloom where you're planted. Jeremiah 29 says, Also seek the peace and prosperity of the people of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Years later, we find Paul cautioning against complacency to the church in Thessalonica. The message of tonight's gospel, the message then is, Christ is our master and we are his servants, both waiting and working servants. Servants that are to do him honor in waiting for him. 
We must be like those servants in the parable, people that wait for the Lord, that sit up late while he stays out late to be ready to receive him. Christ our Master, though he is gone from us now, will return again. So keep your lamps burning as you wait his return. And when he returns, wow. I want to paint a picture. Picture this. The master of the house is away. Where he is, is glorious. It's without compare. It's a fabulous wedding banquet. He is dressed to the nines. He's wearing all of his finest regalia. There's nothing humble here. Truly glorious. Then, finally, after the servants have been patiently waiting for a long time, he returns. And then he does something very strange, very unheard of, something that we have difficult time understanding. Something that we, have, we find it very hard to comprehend. Immediately upon entering the house, the master strips down to his work clothes. You didn't know he had work clothes. Yeah. Who would have thought the master dresses himself as a servant, humble, very humble. His servant clothes are kind of tattered. In fact, there's a red stain here on the side. Now he is dressed to serve. Really. Listen again. Tonight's gospel continues in verse 37. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. They, we, the servants, become the served. To wait upon one's servant seems foreign to us, but that's exactly part of the mystery of God's plan. In his love for us, the master became a servant. While among his disciples, Jesus modeled his service as he girded himself with a towel and washed their feet. And on the cross, he made the ultimate sacrifice of service by dying for us only to rise again on Easter. And as a servant, he has gone ahead to the Father to prepare a place for us. As John says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? We do not know the precise time of his coming, but we are certain that he will return. We know that those who are dressed in the attire, the armor, of God, the attire that he has provided, those who keep their lamps burning will enter the, his rest. And as scripture says, we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. And his works have been finished since the creation of the world. Hebrews 4 verse 3. Now may the peace of God that exceeds, exceeds all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain seated as we sing the next hymn, When Peace Like a River.
And now please stand for prayer. Lord, as we bring our prayers to you on this New Year's Eve, we give you thanks for your blessings poured upon us this past year and for the reality that you are with us, you are for us, and nothing can separate us from your love. We ask your continual blessings, mercy, and grace to be upon us in the coming year as we live as your children, always in your forgiveness, your love, and your life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, hear us as we bring our concerns for the whole world. May the coming year be marked with peace and goodwill among all nations. Bless our national and local leaders with godly wisdom as they govern for the good of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray also for the individual needs known to each of us as we enter a new year of your mercy and grace. We offer now in silence the personal prayers of our hearts. Dear Lord, tonight we also pray for Joe, who is hospitalized and on a respirator, and also for Isla, who is suffering with COVID. Lord, you know their needs and our needs as well. Heal us all in your good time and in your good way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all power and love, build up your church to enable it to rise in your strength so that the good news of your salvation in Jesus may be spread far and wide, especially to those who are living apart from you. Use each one of us in our church family that fulfilling your ministry among us and through us, we would love the Lord our God and love our neighbor as well, continuing to be a community of faith centered in Christ, called to serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear prayer. our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, All praise to thee, my God, this night.